Good evening, everyone. I'm Jane Ward, president of Friends of the Edgewater Library, and I welcome you to tonight's program, The Watergate Girl Goes to the Library, featuring Jill Weinbanks and Nina Barrett. We are so pleased to have Jill and Nina joining us tonight for what promises to be a lively conversation. It's always special when we can celebrate our local authors and their books. What we're also celebrating this evening is National Library Week. This year's theme is Welcome to Your Library, intended to promote the idea that libraries are much more than the buildings that house them. This pandemic year has brought some changes to the way library services have been carried out, but at every unexpected turn, your neighborhood library has determined and, that, and then met the changing needs of the community. So take a minute on your next visit to the library to say thank you to your library staff. This year has been challenging for them and stressful at times, but through it all, they have continued to bring you what you need and what you love. We at Friends of the Edgewater Library are grateful that we've been able to continue bringing you programs, albeit in a different way. Our programs help bring attention to our neighborhood library and help us build our membership. There will be information later in the chat space if you're interested in joining us in our library advocacy work. Now on to tonight's celebration of libraries and reading and authors. We have with us Jill Weinbanks, Jill is currently an MSNBC legal analyst and a sought after speaker on such topics as politics and law. She began her career as the first woman to serve as an organized crime prosecutor at the US Department of Justice in Washington. Her trial win record led, her to, led to her selection as one of the three assistant Watergate special prosecutors. Her team delivered evidence that would serve as a roadmap to impeachment. She was also a major player in the Watergate tapes hearing, cross-examining Rosemary Woods, President Nixon's secretary. We have Nina Barrett. Nina is the author of four books, including most recently, The Leopold and Loeb Files, an intimate look at one of America's most infamous crimes. Her articles, essays, and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, the Chicago Tribune, and many other publications. She also trained as a professional chef and her food reporting for Chicago's NPR station WBEZ earned her the James Beard Award for best radio show in 2012 and 2013. If you are a book lover, you may know her best as owner and founder of Bookends and Beginnings Bookstore in Evanston. Welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us and I'm going to turn the platform over to you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I, it is through, through my bookstore in Evanston that I've had the pleasure of getting to know Jill a little bit. And um, I just want to start by saying that she may have sounded high powered in that introduction, but that introduction actually left out several of her other high powered <laughs> credentials, which, you know, would probably take too long to recite, but I want to start out by establishing, Jill, how dazzling <laughs> your career really has been. Um, yes, you were the first female attorney in the organized crime and labor racketeering section at the U.S. Department of Justice. Yes, you were one of three trial lawyers and the only woman on the Watergate Special Prosecutor's Obstruction of Justice and Cover-Up Task Force. But then you were also the first woman to serve as general counsel for the U.S. Army. And then you were <laughs> Illinois' first female deputy attorney general. And then you were the first woman to be the executive director of the American Bar Association. And after that, there were a few executive positions with Motorola and Maytag. So it seems to me like the only thing you really hadn't done up until now was write a book. <laughs> but now you have. So can you tell us why um, this you know, this far along after Watergate, why was this the time that you decided to sit down and write a memoir about this? Well, I was asked to write this book in 1976, right after the Watergate trial. And I said, I'm too busy. 
I have too much to do. I'm working too hard. I can't do it. But the truth is I also felt too insecure to do it. I didn't think I had enough to say or enough insight. And with the passage of years, I realized that I actually do have a unique perspective on all the events. As the only woman, and I fight against ever being identified as a lady lawyer, even though that's how I was often introduced, um, that as a woman, I did have different insights. I saw things differently. I watched witnesses interact with their spouses in different ways than the men ever thought about noticing. And so it was a combination of the years passing, giving me some sense that I actually did have something to say. The fact that I theoretically retired, obviously I have failed at that, but I theoretically retired. And so I had no more excuse of, I have a full-time job, I can't do this. And that I then ended up, um, once I started writing, I went to something called Ragdale, which is a artist community in uh, our local area in Lake Forest. And one of the people I met there, one of the other artists in residence, called me after I left and said, I just heard about a course in how to write an op-ed. And I bet you have something to say. This was shortly after President Trump had become president. And I took the course on a Sunday and on Tuesday, Trump fired Comey. And so I had something to write about. And as a result of writing that op-ed and getting it published, I was asked to go on television to talk about it. And I thought it would be a one-time thing, but it turned out to be now I'm in my fourth year. Um, and that built an audience. I had people now on Twitter saying, please write a book. We'd love to know more. And that gave me the encouragement to actually sit down and actually finish the book that I had started before all this happened. And um, I felt like the fact that there were so many similarities between President Nixon and President Trump, that there was a current reason for doing it. I felt that the gender bias I faced has not gone away. I graduated law school in 1968. And even today, as I speak in law schools or just talk to you know, young lawyers and young people in business, I talk to high school students even, they face some of the same challenges that I faced. Um, it's not always as blatant as what I faced because there were no laws against it. People could say out loud or advertise. Newspaper ads were help wanted male, help wanted female. And that was legal. You can't do that now, but back then it was okay. I was asked how many children I was going to have in job interviews. What kind of birth control did I use? No one would ask those questions, but they get around to it in other ways. Those hurdles still exist. So I felt that my experience in overcoming those hurdles had a role to play in modern life and that it was worth telling the story now. So that's how it came to be now. That's really interesting. And I want to go deeper into a number of the things that you just said there. Um, but I think that first, and maybe this seems a little bit obvious, but I think that there are young people out there who have only a very blurry idea of what, what was Watergate. You know, like it's a, a, a catch-all phrase that I think people, and we don't want to tell the whole story here, but I'm wondering, do you have some kind of Reader's Digest um, summary of what, what we are talking about when we talk about Watergate. Absolutely, and, and I forgot to say in the beginning, and I wanna say because, especially because this is library week, is libraries have been an important part of my life. Um, I went to Graham Stewart uh, grade school on Broadway and the library just um, half a block from the school was where I got my first introduction to the world of books and to living a life beyond my own narrow confines through books. And so I wanna say thank you to the library for sponsoring this event. And I, I meant to say that earlier, but I didn't. So the, the short answer about what is Watergate, which now, I mean, every scandal has a gate attached. We today have Gates Gate and everything has been a, a gate. Trump gate, uh, Russia gate. 
Uh, but what, what was Watergate? Watergate was basically the break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters in the Watergate complex, which is where the gate came from. Um, that just happened to be where the DNC's offices were. The break-in was conducted by members of what was known as the Plumbers Unit. That was a White House and campaign committee to reelect the president um, called Creep. They funded the burglars, this, this unit, which was intended, called plumbers, because they were intended to uh, stem the leaks of information. And one of their earlier episodes had been breaking into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist office to try to get information on him. That wasn't exactly stemming leaks, but they blamed him for leaking the Pentagon Papers. Why they broke in to this, to the DNC, is still sort of a mystery. What exactly did they expect to find is unclear what the value was compared to violating the law. But you had a president who thought if he did it, it was not against the law because he did it. And so they never thought about the morality of violating the law. And the president set the tone from the top. And so other people on his staff felt like they could do anything. And Watergate break-in was part of a larger scheme called Operation Gemstone, which included possibly luring Democratic delegates from the National Convention, which was to be held in Miami, onto a houseboat with prostitutes where they would get uh, videotaped and blackmailed. It included a lot of other silly things. And I, if I can just proffer an idea, which is why would they do this? They had too much money. They didn't have to think twice. In a world, where you have to think about how you're gonna spend money. Would they have chosen to do this or would they have up their spend on television advertising? They had so much cash. It wasn't, nobody had to account for it. There were safes in the White House. In the White House itself, Rosemary Woods, who you mentioned earlier, Rosemary Woods had a safe in her office filled with cash. And so they could spend anything they wanted. When this idea was presented to the attorney general who was still in his office as attorney general, but was soon to become the head of the creep um, of the reelection campaign, he didn't say, this is illegal, get out of my office. He said, a million dollars is too much to spend on this. Lower the budget and I'll fund it. So if they didn't have so much money, they wouldn't have done it. And it did lead after Watergate to campaign finance reform, which Citizens United, a terrible Supreme Court decision has undone. And we're now back to unlimited and unknown, you know, you can now have secret donations. Um, and when we talk about secret donations, one of the reasons for the famous phrase, follow the money, was because when the burglars were arrested, they were wearing very fancy suits and very nice uh, rubber gloves, carrying very expensive cameras. But they also had brand new $100 bills in their pockets. Those $100 bills could have been traced and eventually were to a cashed campaign check that had been given to one of the burglars. He cashed it in Miami where he was from. And that would have shown immediately what the link was between the White House, the campaign, and the burglars. So the reason that the cover-up started was to prevent the FBI from following the trail of money. That was the whole reason for the beginning of the break-in, uh, not the break-in, of the cover-up, was to prevent following the money trail. And so they tried to use the FBI um, to throw them off by having the CIA say, national security, you can't follow that, it'll affect national security. Obviously that's abusing your power in office to use one government agency to stop another from finding out the truth about your crimes. Um, but anyway, that's, that's sort of what it was, was it was a stupid break-in to get information uh, and to wiretap. They put a tap on a phone, it wasn't working. The day they were caught was actually the second break-in. The first time they had put the the tap on, 
but they didn't get caught. The second time they were really stupid and they put a tape on a door so that they could escape quickly and a guard found the tape. And that's what led to their getting caught was the guard seeing the tape. And then there was another sort of Marx Brothers routine, which was they were being observed by a member of their team from the Howard Johnson Hotel across the street from the Watergate. But he got engaged in a television show and was watching television and not looking out the window. So when the police pulled up after the guard had found the tape and called the police, he missed the arrival of the police. And so he didn't call on a walkie talkie to say to them, get out of there, you're, you're, the police are on their way. So that's how they got caught. So there was a series of stupid mistakes. Wow. Um, it really sounds like a, a Three Stooges movie when, when you put it that way, but it had such devastating consequences for the nation. Yes. Um, one of the things I love about the way this book is written is it's very, um, it's very full of you. And it's very, it feels very emotionally honest about the position that you found yourself in as, you know, a young, fairly uh, new to the job <laughs> uh, prosecutor. And I, you know, the way the book actually opens is by you talking about fear, the fear that you felt when you had Rosemary Woods on the witness stand and you were you know, cross-examining her. And your first sentence is, I didn't think I was nervous, but I could barely breathe. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, because you've been such a trailblazer in so many different um, jobs. Can you talk about this element of fear? And is it something that you think that do women bring it more to jobs than men or do they just care about covering it up less or you know talk a little bit about fear in in this in this situation and in general for women who are in work situations well let me start by saying i often feel fear i never let it stop me from doing something that i want to do and i think that's advice that i would pass on to anybody is and i think that some of my male colleagues feel the same thing. Um, I always felt sort of this, you know, imposter syndrome. I'm sure you've, many of you have heard of it. And I thought it was unique to me and to women in general until the day before I left Washington to move to Chicago to marry my husband, Michael, Richard Benvenista, who had been my closest partner, um, and I spent the day together walking around Georgetown and just talking. And that's when he admitted to me that he also suffered from the imposter syndrome, which made me feel a lot better about it. Um, women do hold themselves to a higher standard. Women won't apply for a job if they see a job description and it has 10 qualifications. If they have nine, they don't think they're qualified. They won't apply. A man who has one thinks he's qualified. And so we have to get over that. And if you think the job is something you can do, go for it, convince them. You have to convince yourself first because you can't convince someone else until you convince someone. Never let fear stand in your way. Uh, whether it's things like I've, I did parachute training and yeah, it's scary, but I really wanted to do it. And so you do it. I. Just think you have to do what you want. You have to take calculated risk in life. That means you're not gonna do something crazy. I mean, I wasn't gonna just go stand on a 30 foot building and jump off it. I had some training, I had some expertise and I was wearing a parachute um, that I felt you know, sure was going to open. <laughs> so um, I guess that's, my feeling is that a lot of people have fear. It's just a question of saying, that I'm willing to, sorry, my phone was apparently on and listening to us and is telling me something that I will turn it off. Um, so I, I think we just all have to get over that. And the most fun I've had in my life is doing things that I consider adventurous. And um, to some extent, I will also say 
that I often didn't think about the challenge I was taking on. When I started law school, I did not realize that only 5% of my class was going to be female and that that was a quota. I did not realize, I, I went to law school because I wanted to be a news reporter. I had an undergraduate degree in journalism and I was offered jobs on the woman's page. I was not interested in that kind of reporting. I wanted to cover the courts or foreign affairs. Um, and I thought if I went to law school, I'd be taken more seriously by an editor and I'd get a better job. I did not intend to practice law. But if I had thought about how hard it was to be in law school, I might have chosen a different path. So sometimes ignorance is bliss and enables you to do things. But sometimes I, I, you know, I don't think I realized I'd be the first and only woman at the Department of Justice. But once I was there, I made it you know, my job to figure out how do I get accepted? How can I be one of the guys without being um, disingenuous? As a trial lawyer, you have to be authentic. The jury will not trust you. They will not believe you. I could not pretend to be Jim Neal or Rick Benvenista, who were my two Watergate colleagues, or for that matter, any other great lawyer that I worked with or against. I can only be me. And I'm not flamboyant in court. I'm organized and logical and I present a straightforward set of facts. And I build on things to make them persuasive, but not through style, but just through substance. And I thought that was, you know, was a girl's way of doing it until I joined Jenner and Block when I moved back to Chicago. And Tom Sullivan was one of my partners. And when I worked with him, I found out that he tries cases exactly like I do. He's not a yeller or a screamer. He's not, you know, flamboyant. So then I realized good lawyers come in all different sizes and shapes. And um, again, that made me feel better. Um, so, and, and another thing that comes through really in the book, because I, so I remember watching the original Watergate coverage. Um, <laughs> And just thinking, you know, I was a teenager, and so I was paying attention with probably half my brain. But I remember <laughs> just thinking it was a bunch of white guys who all looked alike, and I couldn't tell one from the other. But so there were very few women in, who were who were protagonists in this story. But the way you write about these women, I mean, my one of my favorite sentences in the book is you describing um, Barbara Jordan. Oh. As you said, you called her a tall, imposing woman who wore fashionable clothes in vivid colors and carried a copy of the Constitution in her purse. Jordan had a Churchillian command of English and spoke in a rich, ringing voice how God would sound if God were a woman <laughs> of color. I mean, that brought her voice back to me in, you know, so... Wasn't her voice extraordinary? It was. It was. It was. It just stopped you dead in your tracks when you heard her. Um, but I, so I want to go back. So even the way that you write about Rosemary Woods, and as the book opens, you're putting her in a very literally, <laughs> physically, and legally awkward <laughs> position thing that became one of the most famous moments from Watergate, the Rosemary stretch. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the Rosemary stretch? That it's such a great episode and it was very significant in changing the public's perception of the crime of Richard Nixon, of the fact that it was a crime. I mean, there, there was Richard Nixon, to put this in context, had won a landslide. And this is after the break in. The break-in was in June. The re-election was in, in November. The Watergate burglars trial was in January, and they were convicted. We were appointed in May. But he won 49 states. He won not only the popular vote, he won, obviously, an electoral landslide. Um, and people liked him. They thought he was doing a good job. So the hurdle to overcome in that situation. Um, and what we had, 
Um, and this becomes relevant today as we hear that there may now be um, a cooperator in uh, the Gates gate, uh, that it looks like his, his agent, um, the tax collector in Florida, uh, may flip and to avoid being convicted for many, many, many years of mandatory prison uh, may actually testify against him. Um, and all we had when we started was John Dean and Jeb Magruder. And frankly, against the president, the president gets the benefit of the doubt. So if you have these two young, um, you know, 30 year olds, uh, it's very hard to make a case against the president of the United States. So it was only when we learned about their were tape recordings. So John Dean had testified, I had a conversation on March 21st. I told the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. Well, that's his word against the president. But then we heard there were tapes. So when we subpoenaed the tapes, that obviously would have been one of them because it was significant and it would have shown the credibility of our chief witness. And the president said, Nope, you can't have the tapes. I have immunity and you're not getting them. We went to court, we won. He said, no, nope, I'm stonewalling basically. I'm, you're not getting them. And the public reaction was so strong. We had a press conference after he finally said, here's what I'll do is I'll let a very elderly Senator who had, had, um, had been attacked and had had a serious injury and was nearly deaf. I'll give it to him. He can listen and he'll he'll verify transcripts that I prepare. And if anyone's listening to the Floyd um, tape, the, the, the sound of his voice and has been watching the trial where the defense played a tape and said, that says I ate too many drugs, didn't it? One witness said, no, it doesn't. And the other said, nah, maybe. And then it was played in context and that same witness said, no, it says, I ain't done no drugs, not I ate too many drugs. And so the same thing was true in getting these tapes. But anyway, they, they said, no, you can't have them. We had a press conference at which Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor said, here's why we need them. Here's why we have a right to them. And Richard Nixon fired the attorney general who refused to fire Cox, fired the deputy attorney general who became acting and refused to fire him and made the solicitor general, the acting attorney general and he fired Cox. That was known as the Saturday night massacre, which is the thing that I ended up comparing to Comey's firing that led to my being on television. And we had a, um, this was following our press conference saying why we needed them. The American people had heard our case and they believed it. And so the, the protest was so vociferous and there was so much mail in those days, it was actual letters. So gigantic canvas sacks of mail were brought to our office and to the White House. And three days after he fired Cox, Richard Nixon said, okay, I'll appoint a new special prosecutor and you can have the tapes. So now we, okay, we're waiting for the tapes. And that was October 20th, the, the Saturday Night Massacre, the 23rd, he said, I'll reverse. On the 31st, on the eve of Halloween, he had us come back to court. His lawyers called us to court where they announced, well, there are two tapes that are missing. Judge Sirica was very suspicious, ordered a hearing. During that hearing, um, they described why those two tapes, one was from the residence, which wasn't on the taping system, and the other, there was just a malfunction. And the tapes hearing ended without too much um, that made us doubt that that was true. But then they made a really fatal mistake. On the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, so less than a, a month later, they said, oh, there's a third tape that has an 18 and a half minute gap. And so we can't give you that one either. And we'd only asked for nine. So now we're down three. Judge Sirica said, let's have another hearing to find out what happened to this tape. And 
The White House went further. They said, we've discovered this gap. There's no innocent explanation and only Rosemary Woods can explain it. So they were throwing her under the bus. And I had questioned her in the first hearing about the other two tapes. So she was gonna be my witness now that she was the chief suspect. When you read the first sentence about I was nervous, I was gonna violate the first rule that you ever learn about cross-examination. Never ask a question you don't know the answer to. I had no idea what she was gonna say. I knew exactly what they had said in court. Only Rosemary can explain this gap. So all I could do was say, tell us what happened. I had no idea what she was going to say. And I, of course I had read everything she said in the first hearing. I, you know, I prepared as much as you can. And then I had to just listen and react. My first reaction was her verbal descriptions sounded absurd. So I said, let's bring the equipment to court and you can show us. So the equipment was brought from the White House and this was a reel to reel tape machine. And I actually, I just found, I haven't used this. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. I don't know if you can find the right ones fast enough. I just was going cleaning up the basement part of COVID when you're locked up at home. And I found a series of evidence photographs. These are actual White House and, and they smell because they've been molding in my basement. So it's not a, not a good, good look. But um, let's see if I can find, here's what her office looked like. Her electric typewriter and next to it is this reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. Um, for those of us who are too modern to know what real, let's see if I can find. There's one here that really shows the tape machine. Oh, here's a closer up of it. Oh, we're still not seeing the reels, but pay attention to one key. You see that one key that stands out? That's the record key, the one that's darker than all the others. So when she said, I accidentally hit the record key, I didn't notice it. Well, it's pretty obvious um, that it's the wrong key. Um, anyway, they brought those, these pieces of equipment into uh, the courtroom. And anybody who's been in a court knows that the witness box is a fairly small you know, thing not at all like her executive desk, uh, which you can see is a full executive size. And so we put it down with the tape machine, with a pedal under it that she operated it with. And as soon as I asked her to demonstrate she put her foot on the pedal and the tape started re you know, moving Together. And I said, and then what happened? She said, well, the phone rang and I had to take off the headphones, which she had already removed because when I first started questioning her, she said, I'm sorry, I can't hear you as she held out the headphone. So I said, okay, put it next to the machine. And then she very gently pointed to the headphones. And with moving her hand just this far, her foot came off the pedal and you could see the tape machine stopped. Once it stopped, there's no erasure. And at that moment, I felt like Perry Mason having caught her on the stand line. The press in the room fled to a bank of pay phones, again, long before there were cell phones. And so for those who don't remember, we used to have pay phones in you know, a, a row. And so to call in the story, they ran out to the pay phones and she muttered, well, it's different in my office. And I said, well, Your Honor, maybe we should adjourn to her office. And nobody objected to my surprise. And so for the first time in my life, I was not only in the White House, I was next to the Oval Office. And she repeated her demonstration. We, you know, the equipment was brought back. And the picture of her doing this became the front page of every newspaper, every magazine. Um, and showed that it didn't happen that way. And the American people responded. They saw one, that she was thrown under the bus, but two, that she was lying, that there had been a deliberate erasure. And we eventually were able to prove, not only was it not just, I hit the wrong button and it erased, but that there were eight or nine separate erasures, which means someone listened, erased, listened some more erased, listened some more erased, 
it was not an accident. And um, that changed how America reacted to the entire Watergate case. So it became very, very important. Yeah, and uh, how wonderful is it that you just have these archival photos that you just got out of your basement? I, um, I think I'm going to say again, one of the things I just love about you is like you are simultaneously holding this prosecutorial killer instinct. You did what you needed to do for that case. But when you write about her in the book, you're really quite empathic toward her. And, um, you know, about like what her relationship with Nixon was like, she was his secretary, but, you know, had she been a man in a, you know, or had she been a woman now, would she yes. have been the chief of staff? And, and, you know, I was just, I thought it was very poignant when you point out that she was born three years before women had the right to vote. So very different time. It was, and I, I really, when I started writing the book, I really wanted to learn more about her. Her life changed because of me and mine because of her. Um, it, it, in fact, I, one of the reasons that I am married to Michael Banks is because he saw my picture in the paper. We had dated in high school uh, and in summers, he was at a different college. So we went out in summers between college uh, but we had lost touch and he saw my picture in the paper because of this. And that's how we re-met. So, I mean, I owe a lot to Rosemary Woods. And I just felt that I wanted to tell the story with human beings, not caricatures. And I tried my best to get information about her. I would not have been so sympathetic, by the way, at, if I had written the book in 1976. I, was, I don't think I was so sympathetic. But as I learned from my research about her, and as I listened to tape recordings of Rose and the president speaking, she was not what we would think of as a secretary. She was an advisor to him. She guided him. She helped him form policies. She helped him make decisions. She, by the way, is the one that he asked to tell his wife and daughters that he was resigning. He was afraid to do that. He was embarrassed. He asked her to do that. So you can see how close they were and why I say she had been a gatekeeper for all the years that she worked for him when he was in the Senate. And I think she would have been the chief of staff in a different generation. But I was stymied in trying to get information about her because everybody that I called hung up on me. They thought I was the enemy who had embarrassed her. Now, of course, I didn't do anything except ask her to tell the truth. She embarrassed herself by what she had to say, but I failed. I was unable to get anyone to talk to me. And then I told this story on Fresh Air when I was on my very abbreviated book tour because the book came out last February 25th. And we all know what happened in March. The world ended and my book tour ended. But while I was still on the book tour, I was on Fresh Air and I told this story and I got a call from her grandnephew who said, I'd be willing to talk to you. And I've spent several hours talking to him and learning much more about her that I found fascinating. And someday maybe I'll, I'll write maybe an article about her or do something because um, I really feel listening to the tapes and then listening to her nephew, her grandnephew, that I know a little bit more about her. And um, I, I still think she didn't obviously do what she said she did. That is not how the tape got erased. But I actually believe she might actually have thought that that was the case, even though it was a ridiculous story. And I believe that Richard Nixon knew better and let her think that, for which I think that's a pretty unforgivable act for someone who had been so loyal to him. Okay. Well, that brings us to the elephant in the room. <laughs> um, and we, do, I wanna, we wanna leave time to take questions from the audience. So, and of course, we don't wanna tell you everything that's in the book because we'd love you to either take the book out of the library or buy it from your friendly local bookstore. But we do need to talk about Nixon. We need to talk about um, 
and here's how I'm going to formulate it. You know, you, you do talk in the book about your just shock at feeling that you could find out that the president of the United States could engage in criminal activities and not care about the constitution. <laughs> so we, you know, we, it, during Watergate times, you know, as soon as it came out that Nixon was a crook, the public abandoned him and even, you know, the Republicans abandoned him and that's why he had to resign. We've just been through something very similar and with a different outcome. And I just would like to you to talk a little bit about then versus now. Well, I would say there are many similarities that are obvious in terms of the personality. Both of both presidents, Trump and Nixon, were insecure, um, and uh, they played it out in different ways. But Nixon didn't get away with it because we were in an era of bipartisanship and news having only three outlets, uh, well, newspapers, and but in terms of television, there were three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. That was it. And they all had the same facts. They might have different opinions about what the facts meant, but nobody argued about alternative facts. In this era where we have silos of information and people live in their own bubble, it's possible for the president for anybody uh, to say, this is not true, this is true. And the people who listen to that outlet believe it. And so that's what makes the big difference is that back then the facts were clear. Republicans heard the same facts and they acted on them. And as you noted, what happened in the end, we subpoenaed 64 additional tapes after that first nine for trial. And that's the case that actually went to the Supreme Court. But once the Supreme Court ruled unanimously and we were given the tapes, there was what became known as the smoking gun tape. And that's the one where I was talking about where the uh, president and Haldeman are talking about using the CIA to stop the FBI and paying hush money and other things. So that was heard by Democrats and Republicans, and they all reached the same conclusion. The president is a crook. The president is guilty. And the three top Republicans went immediately to the White House and said, if you do not resign, you will be convicted on the articles of impeachment. And by the way, they hadn't even been voted by the full house. They had been voted by the Judiciary Committee. And the evidence the Judiciary Committee used was a briefcase of information that our prosecution team got permission from the court to turn over to them when we returned indictments. And so they had been, there were three articles voted and there might've been more if it had continued. Uh, and it's clear that the house would have voted to pass all, all the articles of impeachment. But before it even got to that, the, the top Republican in the Senate, the top Republican in the House, and Barry Goldwater, who had been a candidate for president before that, was considered a leader of the Republican Party, went to the White House and said, you have no more support, you will be convicted. And he said, well, I, I, I must have some support. You're supporting me, aren't you? And allegedly, Barry Goldwater said, you don't even have my vote. And that's when he asked Rose to tell his family he was resigning. And he did, he announced his resignation the next day and left the White House the day after that. And um, we all remember the image of him flying away, you know, with his hands up saying, you know, uh, I'm not a crook, but obviously he was. Looks like we've run out of time too. Well, I know well, I have more questions, but we should give someone else a chance. We've got a few questions coming in and I, I can turn this back over to you, Nina, in, in a few minutes, but I wanna get to some of these um, audience questions too. Because Absolutely. Quite a, 
quite a few really thorough questions in here. Good. One of the first uh, things I learned as a trial lawyer is when the judge has a question, don't keep on arguing, stop and answer his question. So I want the audience questions. All right, great. Um, so this one, so glad to meet you in this forum. Um, I can't wait to read your book. I watched the Watergate hearings every day when I was in college. Um, some have characterized Watergate as rather benign in comparison to the outrageous activities of the previous administration, two impeachments, but fa falling short of consequences. What is your perspective on this? Um, the, the short answer, I mean, the long answer would take longer than we have. The short answer is, yes, things now are much worse. I would say that the second impeachment of Donald Trump certainly is worse. Inciting a insurrection against the authority of the government, trying to interfere with the conduct of congressional action is much, much worse. But it's not that much worse than using the CIA to stop the FBI from investigating. Uh, it's not that much worse than paying hush money to keep people from testifying the truth. It's not much worse than committing perjury in a trial, um, but it is worse. I mean, one goes to the fundamental heart of our democracy, which is voting and the big lie as it is now known is a danger that continues because when you add to what I said about the media and people living in their own silos, you have people who actually believe that and now they're passing voter suppression laws around the country based on the big lie. They say, well, people don't trust the elections. And that's because you lied to them about it. It's because you said that there was fraud when there is not a shred of evidence of fraud. So you can't create a false impression and then try to change our laws to stop people from voting. That's really, really serious. Um, colluding with a foreign government is also maybe worse than misusing your own CIA. It certainly is a serious problem. Um, and, and there was obstruction of justice. The, the collusion wasn't you know, proved in the Mueller report, but obstruction of justice was. So obstruction is the same thing that Nixon uh, was an unindicted co-conspirator for. So, but I do think we're in worse shape now because of uh, the media environment that we live in and because of the lack of bipartisanship. Mm -hmm. Okay, building on that, someone else, Debbie asks a question um, that well, she wants to let you know. Her book group just read the book and it was a delight to participate in the discussion. Um, she asks, do you think that the Office of the Presidency will recover its honor or its decency in fairly quick fashion or do you think there's been irreparable damage? I think it will. I can't say how quickly. Um, I, I'm more worried about the media interfering with facts getting across to people. Because, I mean, if you're paying attention to facts, um, COVID is going to be under control now. We're in, you know, vaccinating three and four million people a day. And that's, you know, extraordinary help to the American economy and to the American people, to the lives of Americans. Um, the infrastructure bill will create millions of good jobs. And so I think that that will help. I think Merrick Garland is going to be very important because I think one of the most damaged agencies through all this was the Department of Justice and both sessions, but more so William Barr. And I think Merrick Garland, who is from our area, guys, he went to Niles North High School, or Niles West, I'm sorry, he went to Niles West. Um, and today he had a, a major role in talking about gun legislation. And I think eventually people will see that having honest people in the White House, you know, getting rid of all the drama, you know, everybody wants to go back to no drama Obama. And boring is good. I'm not worried about, I don't wanna to have to wake up every morning going, what did he do last night? What did he do behind closed doors? What is the risk to America? Um, 
And I don't want to have Pinocchios being awarded every single day. Um, I wore a Pinocchio pin for a long time and it was relevant every day. So um, I, I think that we can restore respect for the Department of Justice, respect for the presidency. I was raised in, in you know, I, I grew up in the 50s and I was raised to respect the office of the president, no matter who the incumbent was. And I think Nina referred to this. It was frightening to me to, you know, realize that the office that I had respected could be filled by a outright criminal, someone who didn't care about law or the constitution. And what could I do to make sure that justice was done and integrity restored? And I, I think people will come to that and that we can, I mean, I, I know how many people on Twitter are saying, I feel so relieved going to bed every night, not knowing that there's something horrible I'll wake up to. So I think yes is the answer. Um, changing gears a little bit, you you brought attention to your pin uh, a second ago, and someone, Sylvia, asks here, can you explain what your pins mean? Yes, um, I have always loved pins, and I actually am thinking of doing a second book about pins. Um, I, I used to wear them because they were just pretty accessories. I've always liked them. Um, and it was a way, you know, in a male world where I had to wear suits to make my suit look more feminine. And the pin I'm wearing today is, unfortunately it's on cockeyed and I can't get it straight, but it's uh, a couple with a woman dancing backwards and in high heels. And that was a title I originally considered for my book because it's one of the hurdles that women have to overcome. We have to do everything better than men and we have to do it backwards and in high heels. This was said about Ginger Rogers who danced with Fred Astaire, but it just, my, my book has, two themes. One is a time when democracy worked, when justice prevailed. Um, and the other is the hurdles that women had to overcome and how I overcame those hurdles. So it fits with the hurdle theme of the book. And um, when I first went on television, men were all wearing lapel pin flags. And I thought, oh, that's so boring, but I love pins. So what do I have in my collection that I could wear that would be a little different? And the very first pin I wore was a probably 1920s, 30s uh, celluloid pin of an eagle holding a sign that said, defend America. It was because it's celluloid, it was almost see-through. I thought no one will notice it, but sure enough, someone noticed it and tweeted to me saying, tell me about your pin, it's fascinating. And I thought, well, if I can send a message through my pins, I should start wearing pins that send a message. And it became an obsession to find them. But then my Twitter and Facebook and Instagram followers um, started sending me pins. And the best pins I have came from followers who sent me these great pins, complete with what they thought they stood for. And um so it's, it's just become a thing to try to always find a pin that's relevant to the issues of the day. Um, let's see. Well, you, you mentioned the title of your book almost was something else. How did you arrive, given that you just talked a lot about how it felt to be the first woman, how did you arrive at a title that has the word girl in it? That's a great question. Um, authors don't often get to pick their title. And when this title was suggested, I said, not any book with my name on it is going to say girl. I hate being called a lady lawyer. I hate being called girl. I hated being called the mini skirted lawyer. No way. And my editor who was a genius said, first of all, what captures the era better than girl. And I hesitated because a lot of the stories in the book, I am called girl. When I asked for my first trial, I was told, well, but you're a girl. You'd be more vulnerable in a trial court. You're safe in appeals where it's just lawyers. In trials, you'd be with made members of the mob. So they were right. It did. And then my editor went on to say, 
And I want you to think about how many books with the word girl in it are bestsellers. The girl with the dragon tattoo, the girl on the train, et cetera, et cetera. And so I thought, well, I've never written a book before and he's published a lot of them. So if he thinks this is a good title, I'm gonna go with it. And I have to say, I am so completely comfortable with it now because it does capture the era that I was writing about. And I was trying to write about an era, not just my experience in it. I'm gonna take one more question that has to do with uh, the law, and then I'm gonna move into something else, but I have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, this one is, uh, hello, Jill from Sheila. I am curious, are you watching the Derek Chauvin trial every day? <laughs> I personally wish that I had an interview interview with you every day to hear your insights on that trial. And thank you for being a trailblazer. Thank you, Sheila. Um, yes, I am watching it very, very closely. And I'm finding it fascinating and mostly quite emotional. I mean, uh, anyone watching it has been reduced to tears at some point. And if you think about the family of George Floyd watching this trial, you will be brought to tears. Um, today's witness was a remarkable doctor, a pulmonologist and a critical care doctor who was like a dream witness. As any lawyer would say, this man connected with the jury. He had them unbuttoning their collar to feel their neck parts, putting their hand on the back of their neck. Um, he looked directly and talked directly to them and re-engaged them completely in technical medical diagnosis of the cause of death, which is one of the important elements in this trial. Um, the prosecution has to prove that Derek Chauvin's knee and conduct, his body weight caused the death. And the defense is trying to show that it was drugs and pre-existing health conditions. And this witness was, I mean, his, his accomplishments, his expertise are, could not be challenged. Um, and yet the defense tried to challenge his, well, you've never testified in a criminal case before. No, I've testified in 50 civil cases. Um, you know, totally irrelevant, but anyway, yes, I am. And, um, I, I haven't been tweeting as much as I usually do about things because I've just been busy with a bunch of other things. Um, and I do have two podcasts now. One of them is a hashtag sisters-in-law, which I do with three other analysts from MSNBC, Joyce Vance, Barb McQuaid, and Kimberly Atkins. And that's just us talking. And we will be, we have talked about, um, various legal issues from the case on our podcast. And tomorrow's episode, um, we'll also talk about some of the um, issues that are happening. We'll also be talking about Matt Gates and some other issues. So you can always tune into uh, hashtag Sisters in Law wherever you get your podcasts. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to come back to some of these audience questions, but I just want to take a break and go a little bit into um, something a little lighter. Um, can you share with us, I would like both of you to share, uh, an early memory or a your strongest memory of your relationship with the public libraries? Oh, I definitely can. Um, the one that pops out at me, again, as I said, across the street from Graham Stewart on Broadway uh, near Wilson, was my local branch library. And I remember the librarian recommending Booth Tarkington's 17 to me. And I just felt like I was living in a different world reading that. And uh, I've had a lifelong love of books based on my experience in the library. Um, I've always loved memoir and biography and autobiography, because I feel like you learn real life lessons, how people who succeeded or who failed, you know, why did they fail? How did they, you know, what, what went wrong? What could they have done differently? But mostly I try to read about people like, oh, Catherine Graham, who succeeded dramatically to find out um, how to do it. So that's, that's my best memory of, of the library. And, and going to 
downtown to what was then the public library, but is now um, the cultural center and was so covered with grime that who knew that it had those gorgeous ceilings back then? It was just the library, but everybody should go there now and see it because it's so beautiful. That's a good point. It is a beautiful building. Nina, what about you? I mean, uh, it's obvious you have a, a love of books and reading and you do this daily for your, for your work. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how a, the public library might have influenced your, your life, either early life or more recently? Um, well, yeah, sure. I actually grew up in a very rural part of Connecticut where, you know, it was sort of a depressed mill area and there, there just wasn't very much there. There weren't bookstores at all, um, but there was a great public library. And so that's where I, you know, that's where all of my reading material as a kid came from. I'm also, I'm remembering this fantastic series of biographies that were all, I think they were called like the childhoods of famous Americans. And they were all about, they, they, so they viewed the person who later became famous from as a child. And there were a lot of them about women. And there was so little, there were so few biographies of women that were, you know, appropriate for a third grade kid. So I just ripped through all of those. And, you know, I, I feel like that was an enormous um, yeah. message from the universe to me that, you know, you, you didn't start out being famous in life. You started out being a kid and then you did something important. I started out with Sherry Ames and Nancy Drew. Um, but, but I also want to mention, besides libraries, if you haven't been to Bookends and Beginnings, it's really a unique and wonderful space. And cozy, um, obviously less so now because you can't just hang around because of COVID. But we'll get back to that. And it's certainly worth a visit to uh, Nina's store. And it's so important now to uh, support the independent stores, the independent bookstores and the libraries and just uh, let people know that you're, you value the contribution to the community because I think community is something that we, we really need to hold on to right now. So and I also have a deal with Nina where I go to, into the store and sign books that people buy and ask for signed copies, e even personalized. They can say they wanna give it as a birthday present and I will sign it to the person that they're giving it to, so. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because someone in the audience said she's already purchased your books from bookends and beginnings and she wanted to know if she could come back and get it signed so i told absolutely. her absolutely it would connect you with um with nina and you certainly feel free to bring your book in and see if you can get it signed um do you have a time for a few more questions there's some interesting ones here about um president nixon and um relationships with both rosemary woods and pat nixon so if you'd like yes. to take a few absolutely more. sure okay um, what effect do you think Watergate had on the relationship of Pat and Richard Nixon? Oh, boy, I have no insight into that. I really don't. Um, their relationship was tense um, just because of his personality and her personality. Um, I don't know that. I, 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 that's a good question. I'd have to do research. I have no idea. Um, a couple, going back to Rosemary Woods, a couple of people would like to know what happened to her. And also, um, what did she ever, po was she so close to the president at that point that she might have posed a threat to his wife? Or do you know anything about that? Um, I would say she was extremely loyal to him. Um, she was also friends with Pat, his wife. They actually exchanged clothes. Um, and, and by the way, the Rosemary Woods is the sister of the former Sheriff Joseph Woods of Cook County. And Sheriff Woods exchanged suits with Richard Nixon. So it was a, you know, and, and the children called Rose Aunt Rose. Um, that's how close they were. And they frequently dined together. And, you know, it was a very close relationship. Um, one person 
thought that their relationship had become more uh, personal than than anybody thought. But there was one person who said that to me and certainly not anything that I would have ever repeated because there's no, you know, no, um, there's just no evidence to support that. Um, but listening to their conversations between just the two of them and how she advised him on a variety of things um, is, is telling about how much he respected her intellect and her guidance. Um, one more question about Watergate. Do you know the details of Vice President Agnew's resignation? Um, and were you at the time concerned about the effect of losing both the president and the vice president on the grounds of corruption? <laughs> um, yes, I, I, of course, followed, you know, what became his resignation um, and, you know, plea. Um, but no, we didn't. There, there, in a way, we were lucky when John Kennedy was assassinated, there was no way to appoint a new vice president when Lyndon Johnson, his vice president, became president. And that led to the 25th Amendment, which put in place a way to appoint. And so when Nixon appointed a new uh, and vice president, uh, who be then became president when he resigned, um, Gerald Ford, you know, the, the problem I think was pretty much resolved that we had a vice president that if Nixon were removed either through impeachment or I believed then and still believe that there is nothing appropriate in the Office of Legal Counsel opinion that says you cannot indict a sitting president. I believe you can and sometimes you have to. We had more than ample evidence that would have justified doing that. And um, I think that letting someone, you know, let's look backwards. If Richard Nixon had been indicted, would Donald Trump have been more careful in his behavior? Would he have known that there could be consequences as opposed to feeling empowered and like, well, nothing's gonna happen anyway. So I don't know that we did a favor to society by letting him not be indicted. Our compromise was that he would be named an unindicted co-conspirator, which allowed us to introduce the evidence of his conversations, which we couldn't have otherwise, and that we would give the evidence to the impeachment committee, which was conducting a legitimate, fair impeachment. There was an actual chance that he would be convicted. Um, that doesn't exist, it didn't exist during the Trump administration. And unless we fix the lack of bipartisanship, unless we do something about that, there will never be an impeachment ever. Mm -hmm. I, and no one's gonna be convicted. And so we need to find other alternatives to hold someone accountable. And you know, you have in the second impeachment, you have the speaker, uh, who, the, the person who was the majority leader of the Senate saying, well, he's absolutely guilty. I voted to acquit him, but he is morally and legally accountable, but he hasn't gotten away with it yet. And he's emphasized the yet. We have a criminal justice system and we have a civil litigation system and he can still be held accountable. That's a very odd way to avoid your responsibility as a senator to hold accountable for crimes that are clearly worthy of impeachment, is to say, well, let someone sue. And now we have two Ku Klux Klan lawsuits. Um, and today, I think like 10 more uh, members of Congress have joined uh, the, the first of those lawsuits. Um, and there are police two of the Capitol Police have brought a suit for his having incited the riot that led to injuries. So he may be held accountable, but I don't think that saying he couldn't be indicted or that he shouldn't be convicted on impeachable offenses holds any water. I think that's just wrong and that our country needs to get back to 
holding presidents accountable for what they do. Um, obviously, there was a political consequence. He wasn't reelected, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean there's, you know, and, and there's still, let's face it, there's Georgia has cases looking at him. Uh, so Georgia, the District of Columbia, Manhattan, New York Attorney General, there's plenty of possibilities. And then there's the civil litigation that has been brought against him. So he may actually be held accountable. Thank you for your insight. One more question for both of you, and I'm gonna start with Nina. Nina, what is um, what are you reading now or what is on your to be read pile of books? Anything that you can recommend to our audience? Oh gosh, so I, <laughs> I'm mostly reading our event books. Um, I'm actually, well, this is my own obsession. <laughs> we didn't talk about Leopold and Loeb today at all, mm -hmm. but um, so, so that's my, my last book was about Leopold and Loeb. And um, I'm kind of obsessed with uh, the houses in Hyde Park. Um, and I just got, ooh. I just got this wonderful book that I special ordered from myself from, I think it's, I think it's University of Chicago Press. That's, it's called something like The Houses of Hyde Park. Mm -hmm. And it takes you inside all those, you know, incredible mansions yeah. and tells you about their history. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I'm, that's my guilty pleasure read right now when I'm not reading books that, you know, have to do with our events. Yeah. Good. That sounds an interesting one for everybody to read. And Jill, what about you? What are you, what are you reading currently or what is something you have on a to be read pile? I have a bookcase of to be reads. Mm -hmm. um, my reading now is focused a lot on my ability to do commentary. So um, when in the trial they mention Graham v. Connor, I have to go read the lawsuit, the, the Supreme Court decision in Graham v. Connor. I have to read the uh, Atlantic article about who were the protesters and what danger do they pose to America. Um, so I, I mostly, I have to say, reading um, opinion pieces in various sources and um, just news stories to stay current on, on what's going on, looking up, you know, what does, uh, you know, substantial cause of death mean? Uh, it's not very exciting, but I occasionally, you know, uh, my reading is almost all nonfiction, I would say. Um, although Nina did send me a book, um, oh, no, what Nina, someone sent me a book that was a fiction, and I can't even remember the name of it now, but I enjoyed that. Uh, but mostly I read nonfiction. And I've read a lot lately about, you know, white fragility in, in that category of thing, trying to understand um, what we can all do to make this a better world. Great. Well, I will leave it on that note because I can't think of a better way to end something than to hope for a better world. And I could talk to you two all night long, but no one would appreciate that. So I'm going to say good night. Um, thank you for being such an engaged audience. And thank you to our guests, Jill and Nina tonight for the very spirited conversation. Um, I wanna thank everyone for participating in this in National Library Week. And please remember what I said, if you uh, frequent a library, please go in and say thank you to your staff sometime this week or whenever you're in next. They will really appreciate it. I, I can promise you that. So good night, everyone. And thanks again for joining us tonight. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.